Washing Tech Policy Podcast, episode number five. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. The U.S. and EU duke it out over privacy. Chinese President Xi Jinping defends China's internet policies. And Shana Glickfield joins us today. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial if you go to washingtech.com forward slash audible. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. The European Union's Gunther Odinger was in Washington, D.C. last week and spoke at Johns Hopkins on Thursday. He spoke about the EU's plans for a unified digital economy in Europe. The effort has been met with cries from leaders inside the U.S. that the plan is protectionist. It was announced amid tensions between the U.S. and EU about U.S. privacy policies and how they jibe or don't jibe with EU's human rights standards. Because also last week, a European Court of Justice Advocate General issued an advisory opinion to strike down a safe harbor provision that has for 15 years allowed U.S. firms to bypass the EU's overall presumption that U.S. privacy policies do not meet the EU standards. Chinese President Xi Jinping was in Washington last week defending China's recent moves to tighten its control over the Internet in China. The new policies call for technologies introduced in China to be, quote, secure and controllable, whatever that means. North America is officially out of IPv4 addresses, but close to 100% of IPv6 addresses are still available. However, only a small percentage of U.S. households are IPv6 compatible. So there's some speculation about how much Internet service providers will be willing to spend to ensure they are able to meet demand. The House Energy and Commerce Committee Subcommittee on Commerce, Manufacturing and Trade will be holding a hearing today on issues related to the sharing economy. They will be looking at how the sharing economy creates jobs, benefits consumers, and addresses policy concerns. It will be taking place at 1015 in Rayburn 2322. National Security Agency Director Admiral Michael Rogers told the Senate committee last week that he plans to reorganize the agency. He said the NSA will enhance its focus on hackers. The last time the agency was reorganized was after the attacks of September 11th, 2001. The House Communications Subcommittee stopped and started on its media ownership hearing last week amid the Pope's visit and House Speaker John Boehner's announced resignation. Republicans on the committee are in favor of relaxing the media ownership rules because of competition from other media, such as over-the-top media. Democrats, for the most part, want to keep the rules in place. The UN released a report entitled Cyber Violence Against Women and Girls, which looks at violence committed against women online around the world. The report is available at unwomen.org. Google is facing antitrust accusations about its Android operating system, according to Bloomberg, citing anonymous sources. Bloomberg stated that the Federal Trade Commission is investigating Google around bundling practices and unfairly thwarting new entrants from entering the mobile market. On the campaign trail last week, Republican presidential hopeful Jeb Bush indicated that he would seek to roll back the net neutrality rules if elected. Bush said the net neutrality rules do nothing more than prevent ISPs from charging the Netflixes of the world for the full value they derive from Internet bandwidth. NBC News reported that NSA spied on Iran while Iranian officials were in the U.S. for U.N. visits. The network said that back in 2007, the White House authorized the NSA to spy on then-Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and his entourage while they were in town. Warner Chappelle Music's copyright of the Happy Birthday song was struck down by a federal judge in California last week. 
Judge George King noted the original authorship of the song is not clear, but said that whoever it was certainly didn't transfer the rights to Summico, which was acquired by Warner Chappelle Music. Pandora announced last week that it paid $500 million in artist royalties last year and $1.5 billion since the company's founding in 2000. Finally, First Lady Michelle Obama announced the launch of a new program advocating for girls' education called 62 Million Girls. Mrs. Obama made the announcement in New York's Central Park at the Global Citizens Council. For you, the listeners of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I've been listening to a lot of Audible lately. I love Audible. I'm a very audio-oriented person, and there are a lot of books I just don't have enough time to sit down and open and physically read. One good example is Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. You can download Steve Jobs or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day free trial today at washingtech.com forward slash audible. Shana Glickfield is amazing and one of my favorite people in the universe. She started out with a Twitter feed here in D.C. and grew it ultimately into the Beekeeper Group, a top-tier public affairs firm. Actually, she had she was doing a lot before the Twitter feed, but that's how I first encountered her with it. And plus, it sounds more dramatic if I say that she started with a Twitter feed. But in any case, she really, she basically did. And the Beekeeper Group is now ranked the number one public affairs firm by WashingTech.com, I just decided. Anyway, we talked about how she got started. We talked about business in general and tips for you in case you've ever thought of branching out on your own. You'll notice, though, that sometimes it sounds a little like Shane is on the phone and at other times she sounds like she's on VoIP. That's because we had some latency issues and we had to switch up. And then I thought some of the sections made more sense if they were moved to different parts of the show. In any case, that's what's going on there. But enjoy it and pay attention. Class is in session. Today we're here with my good friend Shana Glickfield, who is just a powerhouse here in Washington. Shana is a founding partner of the Beekeeper Group, where she helps a wide array of clients with their communications and advocacy strategies. Refinery29 recently named her a real-life Olivia Pope. She's been named PR Week's Top 40 Under 40, so she's just getting started. And no one loves D.C. more than Shana. She's one of the people that makes this city truly an, an awesome place to live. I remember when you had 100 Twitter followers. Oh, my gosh. Way back then, yeah. When Twitter first came out and you used to be able to connect with someone by saying, you're on Twitter, I'm on Twitter. And it was a big... So, and the, so the real-life Olivia Pope, that, that's interesting. So let's start off with this. What do you know? So uh, what do I know or what do I love about... Well, I, we're, I'm, I was trying to have some intrigue. But it didn't work out. This is why I did, this is why I didn't go into acting. This is why this is why I, I did music instead of theater. But tell tell us tell us a little bit about about your your journey. You started off giving travel advice. I saw an article on Mashable on Mashable from two thousand eight where you gave travel advice, and this was back when you were at Amplify. How did your idea for DC Concierge grow into the beekeeper group? Sure. Yeah, I definitely consider myself an accidental entrepreneur. Um, it was never. My school, like so many people who aspire to entrepreneurship, it accidentally fell in my lap. And that was definitely through DC Concierge, which um, was a blog I began, I think, in 2006, 2005, 2000, really early stages of social media. Um, Twitter came out, I believe, a year later. And um, so covering all things about D.C., which was much easier back then because there was a lot less going on here in terms of restaurants, culture, things like that. So the blog got a lot of attention. Keep in mind, this was before bigger platforms like Yelp. And so as a guide to D.C., and um, I thought about 
turning it into a business, but I was having a lot of success helping my clients in DC start and navigate their blogs and new social media platforms based on what I was learning from running my own blog. And so that's the career path I took and uh, started Beekeeper Group back in 2010. That was also the same year I put the blog to sleep. It had served its purpose and DC was getting really hard to keep up with. And so joined up with some business partners and we formed Beekeeper Group. And now there's five partners total and we have about 20 staff, so about 20 employees. So once you decided to start Beekeeper, once it, it evolved from you know doing your own thing at DC Concierge, then meeting up with your business partners, did you put together a formal business plan? Is it something that evolved over time or is it something that you just kind of figured out as you went along? Um, we had an initial premise and ran with it and there wasn't really a very formal business plan. We were all really the digital leads at our respective agencies or on our own and wanted to start a firm where digital was more central to the services that we offered rather than being put in a box way down the hallway um, and not being a part of early communications and advocacy strategy conversations. And so putting technology and new media at the forefront of, of what we did with our common premise and we ran with it and we also decided to start a company. We found a lot of firms in DC in in typical DC fashion were either left-leaning or right-leaning. So we were founded by two Democrats, two Republicans, and a CTO. And so we say we are transpartisan. So um, we won't likely be hired by a real lefty issue or a real right-wing issue. and we don't do any candidate work, but we do a lot of work with trade associations who don't want to be identified as either side of the aisle. Mm-hmm. So trade associations, some nonprofits, some corporations, but really more partisan neutral. So tell me about a difficult patch when you were building your business and how you overcame it. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think the biggest challenge was that when we started our company, we did it because we were passionate about our industry, about the services that we provide. And then as a company grows, something nobody warns you is that you ultimately have to run a business and become a manager and have other people that you delegate to, to do the actual work. And that's really hard just as professionals to let go a little bit of your clients and your vision and let other people implement it. And so one of the nice things about remaining somewhat small is that we're still very hands-on on our client work, but even the smallest part of letting go and growing and all the business aspects to it, those were the real challenges. And now the expertise that you brought in were these folks who had worked on the Hill? Yeah, we look for people who are interested in policy, politics, and sort of in D.C. for a reason, not necessarily because they grew up here. And then also with a passion for innovative communication. So comfortable with social media, if not thriving on social media, have probably started or run their own blog at some point, can sustain content in the long form or have been successful with, I guess, thinking differently or communicating differently in ways around activism and messages rather than brands and products. What are what are kind of your 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 key pieces of advice for someone wanting to start a digital media business or even yeah. just an online business? Right. Well, I mean, you definitely have the quality, Joe, and you're doing it already. It's the passion and the networking. And so just being passionate about what you do carries you forward through long hours, through slow meetings, getting people interested in what you're providing or offering, you have to believe in it yourself. And so when it's your own business and you've seen it work firsthand for other clients, it's much easier to help other people or expand way. And then of course, networking, which is essential probably in any way, shape or form, any industry in DC, but particularly when um, you're responsible not just for doing the work, but bringing in new clients, new opportunities. It's about expanding your network. The hardest thing is finding the energy and time to do it all, right? Yeah, really. So what about people who aren't really comfortable 
networking? Are they just SOL or is, is it something that's learned? Believe it or not, I uh, think it's pretty easy now to connect from behind the screen as well. So you don't even necessarily need to come downtown, do the couple of beers at a networking event on the Hill or anything like that. Even on Twitter, if I find I can connect with people um, who are in my industry, who are interested in what I'm doing, sometimes we can turn that into a real life coffee meeting or a phone call and get to know each other that way. So you really don't need to be completely extroverted and on the go to do this stuff. You can do a lot more through social media than you used to be able to. And um, so now I saw a presentation of yours online about your FOMO condition. It's true. My rare but serious social disorder, fear of missing out syndrome. Is there a cure? I'm working on a cure. Um, (laughs) There's a new phenomenon called JOMO, the joy of missing out. Um, But FOMO has really driven me and social media provides a lot of reasons for me to feel fear of missing out. Uh, Something's always going on and I hate missing out on it. So, but again, you hit a wall sometimes with your energy or um, sometimes like in my case, my family situation changed and now I'm married and settled down more and I want to spend more evenings at home than I used to. So I'm a lot more selective now about which events I go to and when I let FOMO get the best of me. So now you're a lawyer. You're also a lawyer. You're trained as a lawyer. Yes. A recovering lawyer. As I say. You escaped. (laughs) <laughs> and DC is um, full of lawyers who just can't figure out what they're going to do. So, so did you go through a period where you were like, why, why did I go to law school? And then I actually to loved law school. I loved law school. And this was when I was really how we connected in the tech policy world. I studied technology policy in law school. I was a lobbyist in DC for a couple of years. And when I went to law school, the Napster debate was really the big issue in Washington and music on the internet was, was a brand, brand new thing. And so I was really interested in coming back to DC after law school because I knew how fast technology was moving and how slow the policy making process was. And sure enough, here we are, you know, over 10 years later and we're still really having this music on the internet debate, um, just in new, shapes and new platforms rather than Napster, but I never regretted the law degree. It was a great experience, and I actually did practice law for a little bit and then uh, decided to come back into lobbying and happened to work at a firm, which is now Amplify, uh, which is where we first met, and um, they were doing a lot with tech policy clients, and so I was able to transition from the pure technology law practice to more of a public affairs side of tech policy, and then really hooked on to the social media, digital media side of that. And now, can't say I regret the law degree, but I can't say to my parents' dismay that I still use it. Yeah, I remember when when we, we met and you introduced me to Tech Cocktail, and I had no idea what was going on when I first moved here. And you, and you, showed, <laughs> and you told me, to, I, we went to Tech Cocktail, and I was like all buttoned up and everyone was, yeah. you know, hey! You know, it was a great. Yeah, there was a big movement in DC to really, and and there still is to some extent, um, to really put DC on the map as a mini Silicon Valley. Um, and so there's so many events like Tech Cocktail still that support entrepreneurs who are on the media and marketing side, and also people who are on uh, product side as well. And it's like it was just nice to see that there is a place in DC to loosen up. And now, it's the city's a lot different. Just in the last five years, it's changed so much. It's just like a thriving city. It's true. It's amazing. It's so different. So what used to be a small, tight-knit community is now a huge community with turnover as the early startups are now thriving businesses and new startups are coming in. And with all the co-working spaces like WeWork and 1776, some of them being incubators, it's a whole different world here uh, than it was just you know, like you said, five, six years ago. So in addition to Tech Cocktail, what are some other organizations that people may be interested in attending? Yeah, so, I mean, it depends, again, if you're if you're trying to move a product, an app, a policy or message, like the kind of work I do. So there's all kind of, kinds of events there, different places. I've found an interest in developing more of a niche and narrowing that down. So I've been active with more um, women's entrepreneur groups, 
Um, there's one called Her Corner, which I had a great experience with, and another one, um, Femtech. And now Shana Glenzer, another Shana G powerhouse in D.C., um, she runs that. And so I'm going to um, meet up here or there, or Her Corner was a monthly event. So tell me about, you know, you got the notice that you were the top 40 under 40. What was that like in PR? <laughs> well, dare I admit that I had applied for a couple of years before that. So I had really refined uh, my application, but and I was just thrilled to still qualify as under 40. So that was part of the celebration. But it was it was a great honor, and I think what we were doing and the angle that we were presenting, which is a unique area of PR because um, it's so niche to Washington, is the idea of social lobbying. And we're seeing more and more about that in mainstream media as we see companies like Uber who use their – client base as an activist base. Mm -hmm. And that's really what a lot of the work we do for other associations and nonprofits is using the list you have to grow your list and get people to take action around policies that they care about. So Mm -hmm. building a a grassroots movement in today's sort of digital media climate. And um, so using that social lobbying angle to really present myself as a unique communicator, I think, was the secret to the success. Mm-hmm. You, you know, and the, that mobilizing your, your list and mobilizing your audience is important, even for just entrepreneurship that doesn't have anything to do with politics. You know, I'm, I'm signed up for a few lists and, you know, I see if they get attacked in the media, they immediately send us an email and say, can you help me out with this? Can you help offset some of these negative reviews and iTunes, for example? So, right. the, so that that audience and that engagement of the of the list is just so so critical. Yeah, yeah. And so the idea also is that you have to keep that list engaged and not just ask them for favors. So, what are you going to do for them so that when it is your turn to make the ask? they'll be ready to do something for you. Right, and it takes a long time. It takes, <laughs> right. <laughs> it takes a lot more time than, uh, than I think a lot of people are, are ready for. So if you're out there and you're interested in starting a business, be prepared to put a lot of time and energy into really nurturing those in, in relationships, not making it all about yourself and really focusing on really creating value for others because that's what's going to be the key. It's true. It's very true. So Shana, we're going to close, but before we do, I just want to touch base on a few questions. Tell me something about what you, what do you love about what you do? What do you love about being an entrepreneur? What do you love about public affairs? So I love that um, part of my job every day is just to spend time on social media. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and on Facebook and now, of course, on platforms like Snapchat and Periscope. And I love that part of my job is keeping in tune with how people are using social media and digital media and then narrowing that down to how can we use that for activism and policy making and things like that. What was the last book you read that you felt compelled to recommend to everyone you met? Let's see. So um, one book I'm really excited about that I'm still reading is a book called When Millennials Take Over. And my friend Maddie Grant is the author, along with her partner, Jamie Nodder. And what they're really telling us is what businesses and organizations are going to look like when uh, millennials are in power, which in a sense they already are. And so I think everyone's looking at millennials as a demographic and their specific industries. And I think thinking about it in this way of what the future of business looks like is just so fascinating. And we often hear about the best pieces of career advice. What What's the worst piece of career advice you've ever gotten, just so people know what to watch out for? That's a tough one, but I think the worst business advice is really that you have to know where you're going. And I think so much of growing a business is being open to new ideas, being open to changing what you thought your goal was, saying yes to things and opportunities that you didn't see coming, and then you never know where they're going to take you. And just Instead of really fixating on this is the end game, really being open to wherever the journey takes you. (laughs) 
and not knowing, being comfortable not knowing. Nobody ever tells you that's okay. Right. You, you never know what's going right. to happen. Right. You never know. And I always say, um, if you were to tell me three years ago, this is where I'd be, and this is at every point in my career, if you would have told me this is where I would have been three years later, I never would have believed you. And that was because I didn't have an end goal that was very specific that I was working towards. I just took these twists and turns and then looked back and said, wow, that all... That all happened for a reason. And the important thing is that, you know, everybody makes mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes as we go along. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, you know, the key is to just not beat yourself. Be flexible, yeah. Uh, not beat yourself up about it and, and keep moving forward and realize that this is not something that's written in stone. You, you just have to be flexible. So, it's true. So my last question is, t- tell me a, a productivity secret you'd like to share. It doesn't have to be complex. It can just be a tool or a habit. You know, just something you do every day to keep you on top of your game. So I think this is funny. I learned this years ago in the book, Four Hour Work Week. And it's so silly, but because I do so much networking and so many meetings and client meetings and staff meetings and informational interviews and all kinds of things, scheduling can be a real burden on my time. And so I learned that the best thing you can do is when you're trying to schedule a meeting up front, and I'm surprised how many people don't do this, you say, here are three potential dates and times and a specific location. And you even did this with your podcast, which is awesome, which is saying, I'm going to, are you available on this date at this time? And then we didn't have to have all the back and forth about um, how we were going to connect where and when. Um, And so I like to put three options up front because chances are one of those things will work for someone and you can cut back on a lot, a lot of email. Shana, thanks so much for, for, for joining me, joining us. It's been an honor to have you on, and we hope to have you back. Thank you, and I love to talk about this stuff. So if anyone wants to connect um, either through you and your podcast or directly on Twitter at DC Concierge. Sounds good. Take care. Bye. That concludes another episode of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, episode number five. Thanks for joining me. And please reach out. I can be reached at jmiller at washingtech.com. I love to hear from you. What am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? What should I do less of? What should I do more of? I want to hear it all. I want to hear your thoughts. Um, And I can't make it happen without you. So please, please, please email me, jmiller at washingtech.com. I will see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed.